Hi there and welcome to the second in a series of 12 videos I'll be making this year, each of which focuses on a single work of fiction by the Austrian writer Thomas Bernhard. Last month I discussed Wittgenstein's nephew, this month it's the turn of concrete, and in April I'll be looking at the loser. Now, before I speak about concrete, there are two issues I wish to briefly touch upon. Firstly, for anyone new to Bernhard, my first video in this series, sensibly enough, began with a 10 minute or so general introduction to his work, which you may find useful, while for those who are particularly keen, my getting into Thomas Bernhard's fiction video goes into even greater depth. Links to both of those are in the description. Secondly, there is an active discussion group which accompanies this series, so if you wish to read along with me each month and share your thoughts, you're more than welcome to do so. Full details on how to participate can also be found in the description. Okay, with that business dealt with, we can now move on and talk about concrete. So this book was published both in the original German and in English translation in 1982, the same year as Wittgenstein's nephew. And there are indeed a number of similarities between the two works, thematically, formally, and with regard to specific references they include. Thematically, both works are strongly autobiographical, featuring as they do a chronically, if not terminally ill narrator. Both share a strong interest in classical music and both comment on life in Vienna. Formally, each text develops not through the typical means of a plot, but by reframing in the second section what we read in the first. As for shared references, to cite just one example, Paul Wittgenstein, the eponymous nephew, makes a brief appearance in Concrete, where he is once again described as a close friend whose death constituted a significant blow to the narrator. The text of Concrete is purportedly the writing of a man named Rudolf and covers the events of the previous three days or so, which together form a dramatic sequence of two acts, as it were, each of which may be divided into two scenes. The setting for this first act is Rudolf's house in Peiskamp, Upper Austria, and the action begins in the small hours, with his sister having departed that very evening after a short stay. Her presence, as it invariably does, has overwhelmed her brother, aggravating the symptoms of his chronic lung disease, such that we join him in a state of breathless agitation. The entirety of this scene is dominated by the figure of the sister as Rudolf, while desperately attempting to calm himself, mentally reviews her visit, compulsively repeating her words, particularly the disparaging remarks she's aimed at him, and, recalling their relationship since childhood, places her utterances within the context of a sibling rivalry characterised by her success and his failure, for which he holds her personally responsible, though he also lashes out at the world more generally. More specifically, his sister has, as Rudolf sees it, repeatedly ruined the grand intellectual project that would give his life meaning, for, styling himself as a musicologist despite no formal training as such, he has set himself the goal of producing an authoritative work on the composer, Mendelssohn Bartholdi, materials on whom he has gathered during extensive travels throughout Europe during the course of the previous decade. Progress on this work has, however, proved absolutely impossible, and after 10 years of effort, Rudolf has yet to complete so much as the opening sentence, and so, rather than writing what he desires, he gives an account of his failure to do so, and it's this that forms the text of Concrete. And this is how Rudolf describes his final doomed attempt to begin his great work. I stood standing about 25 to 30 feet away from the desk to see whether everything on it was in order. Yes, everything on the desk is in order, I told myself. Everything. I took in everything on the desk, unmoving and unmoved. I looked steadily at the desk until I could see myself sitting at it, as it were from behind. I could see myself bending forward because of my illness in order to write. I saw that I had an unhealthy posture, but then I'm not healthy. I'm thoroughly sick, I told myself. Sitting like that, I told myself, you've already written a few pages on Mendelssohn Bartholdi, perhaps 10 or 12. That's how I sit at the desk when I've written 10 or 12 pages. I stood motionless and observed the posture of my back. That's the back of my maternal grandfather, I thought, about a year before his death. I have the same posture, I told myself. 
Without moving, I compared my own back with my grandfather's, thinking of a particular photograph that had been taken only a year before his death. The man of the intellect is suddenly forced to adopt an unhealthy posture, and shortly afterwards he dies. A year afterwards, I thought. Then the image vanished. I was no longer sitting at my desk. The desk was empty, and so was the sheet of paper on it. This first scene closes with Rudolph taking his sister's advice to travel, though he fears a long journey may kill him, and after considering various destinations, he telephones his travel agent and arranges to depart the next day for Parma on the Mediterranean island of Mallorca. The next scene focuses on Rudolph's preparations for his trip, the prospect of which sees his agitation take on an increasingly anxious aspect, not only on account of the difficulties that may await him on his journey and at his destination, but also by what may occur during his absence from home, the security of which he has entrusted to his landlady. Interspersed among these fears, both rational and irrational, are various memories, some of which are thematically appropriate and thus appear to be under Rudolf's direct control, memories of his previous travels, of his work on Mendelssohn Bartholdi, etc. But there are also sudden involuntary memories of past humiliations and failures, of his sister and his deceased parents, and of the plans he once made for his future life, a future of which but little now remains. The idea of travel with all its attendant dangers liberates Rudolf from the oppressive presence of his sister and this prompts a reframing of their relationship. Both siblings rise somewhat in our estimation, even as Rudolf becomes more pitiable, the result of him accepting greater responsibility for his various failures. The second and concluding act of concrete comprises two brief scenes, one in a hotel, one in a cemetery, as Rudolf experiences a profound personal crisis, ambiguous in nature, leaving it unclear whether this episode is the result of a spontaneous impulse or represents the logical culmination of the entire text, which, if so, leaves the reader in the extremely awkward position of having derived pleasure from the grimmest form of literary production imaginable. Personally, I found this ending the weakest part of the book, and I will set out my reasons for that in my analysis, which now follows. The first point I wish to touch upon is how concrete, though strongly autobiographical, seeks to distance itself from this fact in a way that Wittgenstein's nephew does not. In that work, Bernhard explicitly identifies himself with his narrator in the opening sentence, having a nurse place a copy of his recently published book, Gargoyles, on his bed. However, in concrete, the narrator is named Rudolf. He's not a writer, but a musicologist. Yet despite these details, there are multiple references in the text that deliberately echo Bernhard's own life and work. For example, the village of Peiskam, where Rudolf lives, is but one minute's drive from Olsdorf, where Bernhard resided. There is mention also of woodcutters, a clear nod to Bernhard's novel of the same name, and when Rudolf engages in people watching at his hotel in Mallorca, he sees a procession of characters drawn from the fictions of Bernhard, the giveaway being the presence of a prince, an obvious reference to Mad Prince Saro in Gargoyles. So, how to account for this difference of approach between Concrete and Wittgenstein's nephew? Well, in my view, three key facts are relevant here. Firstly, Concrete looks forward, no pun intended, to death, whereas Wittgenstein's nephew looks backwards. Consequently, concrete is a much more intense piece of writing, one where disease dominates, as is exemplified by the opening sentence of the original German, a breathless 237 words long. Thus, while Wittgenstein's nephew is about disease, mental and physical, concrete is the direct product of sickness itself. Secondly, Concrete explores family relationships rather than friendship. And thirdly, Rudolf, the book's narrator, is a fundamentally weak character, a physical and nervous wreck, bullied by his sister and with no achievements to speak of. These three facts taken together suggest that it's the painful and intimate aspects of the text that prompt greater fictionalisation on Bernhard's part. And in some respects, this desire to keep on exploring the unfinished business of his life, generating different perspectives depending upon the moment at which he is writing and the memories he chooses to dwell upon, 
recalls the methods of Marguerite Duras, who engaged in a similar process, producing three accounts of her early life, which, though they contradicted one another, were all in a certain sense true. And that's the view I would take with regards to Wittgenstein's nephew and Concrete. The second point I will touch upon more briefly, and that is that Concrete makes use of the motif of a writer not being able to write. This places the text in the tradition of Bernhard's fellow Austrian, Hugo von Hofmannsthal, who produced his Lord Chandos letter, a foundational text of literary modernism in 1902. The Lord Chandos letter is a short but hugely significant and highly imaginative piece of writing, and I strongly urge anyone with an interest in literature to read it, link in the description. My point here, however, is that not only does Concrete share the form and theme of the Chandos letter, but it constitutes an attempt by Bernhard to produce an impossible book, and in that respect, one might regard Concrete as being a deliberate exercise in failure. I believe most readers will identify the book's brief conclusion as the source of this failure, and I see it as a result of a conflict between the events being narrated and the act of narration itself. This conflict is a common feature of illness narratives and has been theorised by, among others, Arthur W. Frank in his excellent book, The Wounded Storyteller. Frank points out that because serious illness is defined by the biographical disruption it entails, it's impossible to produce an accurate account of experiences which, whether temporarily or permanently, profoundly disrupt one's sense of personal identity. This is precisely the problem Bernhard runs into at the end of Concrete, while the previous two phases, marked as they were by Rudolf's agitation and his steadily mounting anxiety, were extremely convincing. The attempt to present a manic depressive episode by way of a climax falls flat because there's simply no way to narrate the contents of such an experience. The final point I wish to touch upon is Bernard's use of italics in concrete. Now, while he employs them for various reasons in his work, they typically signal the presence in the text of the words of others, words which the narrator wishes to object to in the strongest possible terms and maintain their distance from. In concrete, however, because Rudolf, the narrator, is so weak, he finds himself compulsively repeating the words of others, even as he resists accepting the truth that these words assert about who he is. The result is that concrete abounds with what the literary critic Mikhail Bakhtin termed microdialogue, the words of others, of entire groups such as social classes, even of entire nations, by whom we may feel pressured into accepting a particular view of who we are. In this respect, Concrete bears a striking resemblance to a book I've already reviewed for the channel, Patrick Hamilton's superb novel, The Slaves of Solitude, which features a similarly weak protagonist, Miss Roach, who is equally sensitive to the language others use to describe them and shares Rudolph's habit of compulsively repeating their words. Microdialogue also helps explain just why Rudolph's outbursts against his perceived persecutors fan out from his sister to the world at large, and before I bid you farewell, I'll just read you this passage where Rudolf has whipped himself into a frenzy over the idea of keeping a dog. There can be no question of whether or not I should keep a dog. I am mentally opposed to keeping a dog, which I know would have to be given more care and attention than any human being, more than I demand for myself. But humanity sees nothing wrong in the fact that all over the world, Dogs get more care and attention than human beings. That in fact it gives more care and attention to all these billions of dogs than it gives to itself. I take leave to describe such a world as perverse, grossly inhumane and totally mad. If I'm here, the dog's here. If I'm there, the dog's there too. If the dog has to go out, I have to go out too and so on. I won't tolerate this dog comedy, which we can see enacted every day if we only open our eyes and haven't become blinded to it by daily familiarity. In this comedy, a dog comes on the stage and makes life a misery for some human being, exploiting him and in the course of several acts, or just one or two, driving out of him all his harmless humanity. It is said that the tallest, most expensive and most precious tombstone ever set up in the history of the world is one to the memory of a dog. No, not in America, as one inevitably assumes, but in London. Once we get it clear, this fact is enough to show how dog-like humanity really is. 
In this world, the real question to ask about a person has long been, not how humane he is, but how dog-like. Yet up to now, instead of asking how dog-like a person is, which is what they really ought to ask out of respect for the truth, people have always asked how humane he is, and that I find disgusting. There is no question of my keeping a dog. If you kept a dog at least, my sister said, just before she left, it wasn't the first time. She's been saying it for years just to enrage me. So there we have it. Despite moments of brilliance, concrete is ultimately something of a failure. Never mind. There's always the next month. There's always the next Bernhard fiction to look forward to. In April, it will be the loser. My apologies for being rather late in uploading this particular video. I'll try and get back on track with the next one. Okay, all that remains is for me to bid you farewell. So until the next time, be safe, be strong, nanu nanu.